I intended to make a video on how to analyze screenplays. I would have split the screenwriting process into, say, five. Yeah, five is a pretty number. Five aspects, such as dialogue, plot, character and whatnot, and through good and bad examples, we'd check how to create them properly. This idea wouldn't work, though. And here's why. Screenplays actually have only one aspect. Character. Dialogue only works when the characters work. The plot only works when the characters work. Whenever I talk about a movie's dialogue, theme, message, plot, I'm actually talking about the characters. There's nothing else. The most intricate and twisty plot a writer might conceive will only be worth a damn if it springs from the characters' actions and decisions. Otherwise, the script is no better than a bunch of empty events occurring haphazardly. Somehow Palpatine returned. Wait, do we believe this? The same applies to dialogue. A writer can't have his characters spurt whatever is important or funny and call it a day. What does this story mean? You got me. Check this terrible line from Doc Ock in Spider-Man No Way Home. Norman Osborn. Brilliant scientist. Military research. There's nothing wrong with it per se. The problem is Otto Octavius would never phrase his ideas like that. Norman Osborn. Brilliant scientist. Military research. Six words, three sentences, no verbs. Sounds like a memo a screenwriter leaves himself to turn into an actual line later on. That's not what the character sounds like. Compare it to this line from the well-written Spider-Man 2. My rose is dead, my dream is dead, and these monstrous things should be at the bottom of the river, along with me. Doc Ock is a fan of poetry. He speaks in complete, syntactically rich sentences. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. This line has not one, but two synecdoches. It's not the sun in my hand, it's the power of the sun in the palm of my hand which even adds a slight alliteration. Someone who speaks like that would never describe a man he admires like this. Norman Osborn. Brilliant scientist. Military research. Even worse, here's how this idiot played by Jamie Foxx describes a different scientist. Dr. Kirk Connors, he was a scientist at Oscorp when I worked there. A brilliant scientist. These lazy, there's no other word for it, these lazy screenwriters had an eloquent genius describe character X with the same exact words a bumbling loser uses to describe character Y. And we gave this movie two billion dollars. I don't care how fun the movie is, it is, but moviegoers need to be more demanding. And that's why I'm here today. We're gonna analyze what just might be the most perfect screenplay ever written. Joseph L. Mankiewicz's All About Eve. Eve. But more of Eve later. All about Eve, in fact. That's the name of the movie! It has no elaborate plot twists or a high concept, but it has exactly what all screenplays should strive for. Outstanding characters who are the sole catalysts of every event in the story. And they speak incredible dialogue while they're at it. You bought the new girdles a size smaller. I can feel it. Something maybe grew a size larger. When we get home, you're gonna get into one of those girdles and act for two and a half hours. I couldn't get into the girdle in two and a half hours. I cannot emphasize enough how brilliant All About Eve is. It is, shall we say, just as intelligent as an average Rick and Morty fan thinks he is. <laughs> First thing, there isn't a single unnecessary character. The cast contains only 10 characters with names, and they all affect the story in some level. Why else would we be expected to remember their names, right? Have you seen the sheer size of his force, Alexander? Not if you hold them on the left, my brave Parmenion, with your son Philotus, and you, unbreakable Antigonus, Perdiccas, Leonidas, bold Cassander, Nearchus, Polyperchon, a revered Clytus, Ptolemy, and Hephaestion. Bilbo, allow me to introduce Fili, Kili, Oin, Loin, Dorlin, Balin, Bifo, Bofo, Bombo, Dory, Dory, Dory. Now let's get into all about Eve. This is Eve. 
She watches stage actress Margot perform every day. Margot's best friend, Karen, takes an interest in this shy, lonely girl and takes her to meet Margot in her inner circle. Now, these people are a brainy Broadway bunch. They live and breathe theater and are all highly intelligent. They are dramatic and loquacious. Their dialogue is full of figures of speech, declamations, digressions, double entendres, metaphors and lists. You gotta be a genius to write these characters' dialogue for over two hours, and Joseph L. Mankiewicz knows he's one. Is it sabotage? Does my career mean nothing to you? Have you no human consideration? Show me a human and I might have. She's got everything. A born actress. Sensitive, understanding, young, exciting, vibrant. Don't run out of adjectives, dear. Does Miss Channing know that she ordered domestic gin by mistake? The only thing I ordered by mistake is the guests. <laughs> <laughs> They're domestic too and they don't care what they drink as long as it burns. Eve is introduced to Karen's husband, playwright Lloyd, and Margot's boyfriend, director Bill. She tells them her sad life story and the only one unimpressed is Margot's maid, Birdie. What a story. Everything but the bloodhound snapping at her rear end. Birdie is the least educated of the group and the first one to notice that Eve is up to no good. Margot hires Eve as her assistant. Birdie no like it. When Eve plans a birthday party for Margot's boyfriend, only then does she start to resent her biggest fan. And the first thing she does is seek approval from Birdie. You don't like Eve, do you? You want an argument or an answer? An answer. No. Why not? Now you want an argument. Mind this brilliant correction. She thinks only of me, doesn't she? Well, let's say she thinks only about you anyway. Thinking of is innocent, passive. It's when the thought comes to your mind on its own. You can't help it. Margot thinks Eve keeps her in mind as a loved one. Thinking about is planning, concocting, conspiring. Birdie thinks Eve has an ulterior motive. Aren't words beautiful? We get to Bill, Margot's boyfriend's party. Margot is bitter about getting older at just 40 and having the younger Eve around her all the time. So she takes off her frustration on everyone around her. Oh, you gotta meet this guy, the aptly named Edison the Wit. To those of you who do not read, attend the theater, listen to unsponsored radio programs, or know anything of the world in which you live. It is perhaps necessary to introduce myself. He's a theater critic whose pen is sharp and dipped in poison, but not as much as his tongue. He is hated by everyone and could not love it more. I distinctly remember Addison crossing you off my guest list. What are you doing here? Dear Margot, you are an unforgettable Peter Pan. You must pray it again soon. Let's talk about subtext. Every line of dialogue has an objective. The subtext, if you will. A bad screenwriter writes on the nose. He has his characters say exactly what they mean. I'm so happy I have you as my best friend. And I love Lisa so much. A true screenwriter hides the subtext behind the actual words used, adding subtlety and intelligence. Edison enters the party with his date, Miss Caswell, played by pre-fame Marilyn Monroe. He introduces her to producer Max and tells her she should bang Max to do her stage career a favor. You see that man? That's Max Fabian, the producer. Now go and do yourself some good. Of course, that's the subtext. The text always leaves it hidden behind the veil of polite civility. Why do they always look like unhappy rabbits? Because that's what they are. Go and make him happy. In All About Eve, every punch is gloved. Now there's something a girl could make sacrifices for. Yeah, probably Adam. Sable. Sable? Did she say Sable or Gable? Either one. Make sacrifices? Get it? For Sable or Gable? Oh, she did get Gable 11 years later. All I want is a drink. Leave it to me. I'll get you one. Thank you, Mr. Fabian. Well done. I can see your career rising in the east like the sun. Rising? Get it? Subtext. Margot drunkenly insults all her guests, and Mankiewicz flaunts his brilliancy by showing how these people masterfully manipulate language. And please stop acting as if I were the queen mother. I'm sorry I didn't Outside mean... of a beehive, Margot, your behavior would hardly be considered either queenly or motherly. By flinging words and meanings around like an endless tennis match of wit. You have to keep your teeth sharp. All right. But I will not have you sharpen them on me. Or on Eve. What about her teeth? What about her fangs? She hasn't cut them yet and you know it. It spells a paranoid insecurity that you should be ashamed of. God print it. What happens in the next reel? It's your party. Happy birthday. Welcome home. And we who are about to die salute you. 
Need any help? The producer Max sets up an audition for Marilyn Monroe and conveniently or not, Margot misses it, so Eve reads in her place. It turns out Eve is a terrific actress and is given the job of Margot's replacement, as Edison is ecstatic to tell the proud star about. It wasn't a reading, it was a performance. Brilliant. Vivid, something made of music and fire. Music and fire. Margot loves the duo and repeats it until it loses its potency. Music and fire. Fire and music. Fire and music. Fire and music. Why does this combination of words strike such an effect on Margot? Glad you asked. Fire and music happens to be an example of a rare and strongly poetic rhetorical figure called Hendiadus. In a nutshell, it's when a word and its modifier are replaced by two words of equal value. You would expect Edison to say musical fire, but no. He beautifies it into music and fire. Many great poets used Hendiadus. For Shakespeare, life is not full of furious sound. It is full of sound and fury. When Camões mentions the nautical feats of the Portuguese heroes, he doesn't talk about how forceful they were in perilous battle posts. No, he says they were forceful in perils and in battle posts. Leonard Cohen never said that her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. Her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. But don't let me get started on rhetorical figures or I won't stop. Is your idiot brain getting fucked by stupid? It's not rhetorical. But it is rhetorical, Homelander. It's very rhetorical. Is your idiot brain getting fucked by stupid? It's an insult veiled as a question. That's apoplexies. You also want her to answer to humiliate herself. That's subjectio. The agent of the verb is an adjective. Stupid. Adjectives don't fuck or do anything. Nouns do. I'm just gonna say it. This guy fucks, am I right? Because I'm looking at the rest of you guys. This is the guy in the house doing all the fucking, am I right? You know I'm right. This guy fucks. Thank you. When you use a word in an incorrect semantic position, that's catacresis. Anyway, even if it was stupidity, abstract words can't fuck. So it's a personification of ideas. It's prosopopoeia. And here's a synecdoche. You made those words up. Where was I again? Oh, right, all about Eve. Margot takes a passive-aggressive stand against Eve, Bill, Max and Lloyd. If you'd come in the middle, I would have stopped. I couldn't have gone on. What a pity. All that fire and music being turned on. What fire and music? Text. What fire and music? Subtext. Was that a Hendiadus? Those aren't Margot's words. And soon enough... So it must have seemed so, so new and fresh to you, so exciting to have your lines read just as you wrote them. Addison. Bill and Lloyd can't be fooled. They know she's espousing Addison's acidity. You've been talking to that venomous fishwife, Addison DeWitt. Words are a character's soul. Margot is jealous of Eve's talent and youth and spews her venom on Bill. I must have frightened her away. I wouldn't be surprised. Sometimes you frighten me. Poor little flower. Dropped your petals and folded your tent. Don't mix your metaphor. I'll mix what I like. Come on, a theater director knows even Shakespeare was a fan of mixed metaphors. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Take arms against a sea of troubles. Be pity. I can make it newborn babe striding the blast. Oh heavens, cherubim horse. Okay, mix. Karen grows tired of Margot's tantrums and makes sure she misses a performance so Eve can act in her place. Eve becomes a success and critics and audiences love her as much as her Broadway buddies start hating her. Especially after she gives an invective interview about Margot to Edison. She also tries to seduce Bill. Check this exchange. With work and patience, she'll be a good actress. If that's what you want to be. Is that what you want me to be? Bill talks about Eve's career, perfectly professional. Eve adds Bill to the mix, implying desire. I'm talking about you and what you want. So am I. He tries to keep it only about her. She suggests what concerns her concerns him and you can't separate it from wanting. That's level very hard on the dialogue and the wit. What I go after, I want to go after. I don't want it to come after me. Eve threatens Karen for the leading role in Lloyd's next play. If Karen doesn't get it for her, Eve will tell Margot it was Karen's fault she missed the performance, giving Eve room to shine. You do all that just for a part in a play. 
I'd do much more for a part that good. But before Karen can say a word, Margot announces she doesn't want the role, because she'll get married to Bill and she's so satisfied she doesn't feel the need to keep playing younger roles. Basically, old Joe here found two ways to move the plot along and have Eve steal Margot's role. Either blackmail between Eve and Karen, or character growth on Margot's part. And this sneaky hustler used them both. Eve becomes an award-winning actress, but Edison reveals he knows about her scandalous past and blackmails her into becoming his sex slave. Minus the sex, I'd wager. That I should want you at all suddenly strikes me as the height of improbability. But that in itself is probably the reason. You're an improbable person, Eve, and so am I. We have that in common. Also a contempt for humanity, an inability to love and be loved. We deserve each other. Eve is then courted, it's discreet, sort of, by her biggest fan, Phoebe. Edison sees right through her. Do you want some day to have an award like that of your own? More than anything else in the world. Then you must ask Miss Harrington how to get one. Miss Harrington knows all about it. And it becomes perfectly clear that what Eve, or whatever her name is, it's Gertrude Sloshinsky, did to Margot, now Phoebe, or whatever her name is, I call myself Phoebe, will do to Eve. Just to conclude, let's check this caustic exchange between Edison and Margot and read the subtext. Tell me, was Bill swept away too? Does my boyfriend want to fuck Eve? Bill didn't say. But Lloyd was beside himself. He listened to his play as if it had been written by someone else, he said. It sounded so fresh, so new, so full of meaning. You are far too old to play Lloyd's roles. How nice for Lloyd. How nice for Eve. How nice for everybody. Fuck Lloyd. Fuck Eve. Fuck everybody. Eve was incredibly modest. She insisted that no credit was due her. That Lloyd felt as he did only because she read his lines exactly as he'd written them. Eve is a better actress than you and everybody knows it. The implication being that I have not been reading them as written? Fuck you. To the best of my recollection, neither your name nor your performance entered the conversation. Fuck you harder, you washed up hag. And all perfectly polite thanks to subtext. But what's it like when a writer's text is his subtext? Want an example? Well, suppose you need to tell Anakin that Chancellor Palpatine is evil. Anakin, Chancellor Palpatine is evil! And Anakin needs to reply that from his point of view the Jedi are evil. From my point of view the Jedi are evil! Now, how does your character tell another that he hates him? You get the gist. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and share it. And which screenplay would you call the best ever written? Leave a comment. I will see you next time and this is MovieWise.